See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and by it be defiled. It's easy to be bitter. It's easy to feel bitter with a marriage partner who cheats and leaves and ruins your life. It's pretty easy to feel bitter with that. It's easy to feel bitter with a child who rejects all of your well-meaning efforts and messes up, leaving you to pick up the pieces. Pretty easy to feel bitter. Or a parent who favors a less deserving brother or sister over you. Easy for you to feel bitter in a situation like that. It's easy to feel bitter when your hard work is ignored. When your talent goes unappreciated. When your contribution goes unrewarded. It's easy to be bitter when someone else gets the prize that you deserve. Someone else lives and the one that you love dies. Someone else is happy and all you have is loneliness and tears. Do you get my point here? It's easy to be bitter. In a society that promotes victim thinking and provides opportunity for bitterness to remain and actually become profitable, it's difficult to respond to scripture's admonition to see to it that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Now the Bible does not deny the fact that there are many legitimate reasons for feelings of bitterness to exist. I mean it's natural to feel bitter if we're cheated or neglected or abused or ridiculed or ignored. God's word however tells us not to allow that bitterness to grow because if it does it will rule us and then it will destroy us. In an article in the Discipleship Journal, author H. Leshid reviews some things to stop and some things to start in breaking free from the trap of bitterness. And bitterness is really a trap. It's, you know, things happen and then that trap just closes on you and catches you and is very painful. So in order to break free from the grasp of bitterness, there are some basic things we simply have to stop doing because these things feed the bitter root that's within us. Some things that we have to stop doing. We have to stop denying that it, that it exists. We have to stop denying that bitterness is inside of us. You know, when people experience painful events, one way of dealing with them is to ignore that these things have had any effect on them whatsoever. They have a terrible thing that happens, a terrible injustice or whatever, and, and they say, I'm good, I'm fine. Nah, it's good, I can deal with that. Men especially will not acknowledge that they are hurt or bitter because that may be unmasculine. Women deny their hurt because giving vent to their anger may not be feminine and they may not be approved of. But Jesus says that it's the truth that sets us free. John 8, 32. And so the first step to inward healing is the acknowledgement that we feel bitter about whatever. You fill in the blank. We may not be right, we may not be fair, we may not be mature in feeling this way, but to admit the truth about how we feel will begin the process of helping us feel better. So first of all, acknowledge the feeling, if that's what you're feeling. Secondly, stop feeding it. You know, the Hebrew writer warns that we mustn't allow the root of bitterness to spring up, to cause trouble. The only way that bitterness causes trouble 
is if we feed it and if we allow it to continue to exist. We allow it to exist by giving it reason to exist, by giving it excuses for its continued presence. For example, we say to ourselves, well, I deserve to feel this way. Anybody would feel this way if what happened to me happened to them. Or we say to ourselves, that person really meant to hurt me. Or we say to ourselves, I always get a raw deal. Why does this always happen to me? Or we say to ourselves, well, it wasn't my fault. I'm the victim. And so this bitterness can become an excuse for unkind and sinful behavior. For example, I have a right to be mean-spirited and unkind because I've been hurt, so I can just do what I want to other people. Or I can sin and take advantage of grace because I've suffered and God owes me this. We may have a legitimate reason to be bitter in the first place, but to continue this way requires us to feed it and to do so only fuels our own destruction. Now the root of bitterness is like a cancer that grows inwardly and silently. Once we acknowledge that we have it and we stop contributing to its growth, we can actively work to remove it altogether. We have to actively work to remove it altogether. Once we've stopped denying and feeding, we have to start doing the following things in order to be healed completely. What do we need to start doing? Well, first of all, we have to start giving it up. See, the trouble with bitterness is that we, we secretly love it. It gives meaning to our behavior. It's a sort of protection against the pain caused by growth or change. It seems, or rather it serves, as a cover for our own sinfulness at times. I know a man who uses his bitter experiences from the past as an excuse for his alcohol addiction. You know, he says, I drink to forget, and I know that God understands. If we are to be what God calls us to be, holy, pure, the light, filled with the Spirit, we have to remove everything that defiles us, and that includes bitterness. We're always uh, you know, uh, anxious to say, well, you know, I used to smoke and I quit that, and I used to do this, I used to swear and I quit that. Those are the outside things. The hard things to remove are the secret things that only we know about, we and God know about. We give attention to giving up outward sins like abusive speech, as I said, addiction to things like tobacco or pornography or alcohol or whatever. But we rarely want to work on inward things like greed or gluttony or lust or bitterness just to name a few. In the Old Testament, the people would lay their hands on a sacrificial animal in order to signify that they were giving up or they were transferring their sins to the animal, who would then be sacrificed in order to remove their guilt and their sins. We need to repeat the same action of giving up or transferring our sin of bitterness Today we accomplish this in one of two ways. If we're not Christians, we transfer or give up our sins through baptism so that our sins and guilt are put upon Christ and through His death, they're taken away from us. A spiritual thing, a thing not seen, is given up in a way not seen. The transfer of our sins to the cross of Christ. We don't see that, we see the cross. But God has given us baptism as a physical thing that we can see, that we can understand that there is a before 
and there's an after. And in the waters of baptism, that transfer of sin, all sin, ugly sin, deep sin, repeated sin, all those things are transferred to Christ. And then, of course, if we already are Christians and we struggle with this particular sin, we give it up or we transfer it to the cross of Christ through prayer because the cross is always there, the blood is always there for us to transfer our sins. The method is different than it was, but the transferring idea is always the same. Either way, the result is the same. Our bitterness is removed from us and given over to God. And this needs to happen for us to grow and to develop spiritually. And I would say for us to develop emotionally as well. Nothing stunts our emotional growth like bitterness. It's like being trapped in a time capsule, like a Groundhog Day. We keep reliving the same emotion over and over again. We keep responding in exactly the same way over and over again because we're trapped in this, this bitterness capsule. So we have to start giving it up. Secondly, we have to start reconciliation. You know, giving up bitterness to God takes but a moment, but your feelings about what has happened take much longer to catch up. The thing that helps balance your decision to give up bitterness and your ongoing bitter feelings is your effort at reconciliation. Initiating reconciliation is probably one of the hardest things to do because everything inside of you does not want to do this. So here are a few steps to follow to help you get the process going. First of all, live in the forgiveness mode. You know, you have a mode, you know, on your TV, you know, high def, low def, whatever, you know what I'm saying? Set your spirit to forgiveness mode and leave it there. Take the initiative just as God did. Confess your desire and determination to forgive and act on it. This frees you from the you owe me mindset. You don't owe me anything because I have canceled the debt. That's the proactive way of dealing with bitterness. I take control of the situation. I cancel your debt to me. I get rid of the bitterness in doing so. Secondly, make things happen. Moving beyond bitterness means not only leaving traumatic experiences with God, but taking charge of the present. Find something positive to do and do it. And then of course the hard one as I say, initiate reconciliation. Contact with the person or situation that offended you may be painful, but you've decided to forgive, so act on that forgiveness. Blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus said, for they will be called sons of God. Matthew 5, verse 9. He's not talking about world peace. He's talking about the peace that is broken between you and your brother, you and your wife, you and your child, you and your family, you whatever, you and your best friend, you and your workmate. Reconciliation is painful and it goes against our feelings and desires, but it is the mark of a true disciple and one within whom the kingdom is growing. Wherever the kingdom is, there's often pain. Because in the kingdom, God challenges us to grow. And spiritual growth is, awful, is often painful. And so how do, we, how do we get rid of it? We start giving it up. We start reconciliation. And then finally, we start proclaiming God's victory. You know, the message that bitter people give off by their attitude and their actions is that life is unfair. You ever meet people like that? You get into a conversation and eventually it's always the same thing. You know, life is just so unfair. I've been so unfairly treated. Uh, things have just not gone well for me. It's, just, it's not fair. That's bitterness talking. 
Sometimes people or the church or my family are against me. Or you can't trust anybody. You can't trust anything. And of course, my feelings are the most important feelings. And usually in a conversation with someone who's bitter, it's always about their feelings, their worldview. Now this certainly is not the way to glorify God, certainly not a way to win souls. David the psalmist had much to be bitter about. I mean, he risked his life for his king, and yet his king tried to kill him repeatedly. How's that for gratitude? He was anointed king, but he spent years hiding in caves, on the, on the run, camping, while the the other king lived in a palace. Imagine his prayers to God. He served God with all of his heart, but God didn't allow him the one thing that he really wanted to do, and that was to build a temple in Jerusalem. The one thing he wanted to do. And God said, nope, that's not for you. So David watched as evil men continued in their evil ways without punishment, while he had to suffer abuse and attack, but through it all he refused to dwell on his bitterness, choosing instead to remain focused on how great God was and how his justice would ultimately be served. Just a small little passage in Psalm 10 that echoes this idea. Verse 16 he says, the Lord is king forever and ever. Nations have perished from his land. O oh Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to vindicate the orphan and the oppressed so that man who is of the earth will no longer cause terror. David recognized that there are victims in life. It's true. Please don't get me wrong in this sermon. I'm not saying that there are no victims. Of course there are victims. Many of you have been victims of all kinds of things. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying about David is that he moved from being a victim to being one who was victorious. From victim to victor. How? By recognizing that God is a help in every circumstance and that in the end God will render justice for all offenses and forgiveness for all those who have themselves offered forgiveness to others. So I want you to ask yourselves a question this morning. Maybe two questions. First question, are you becoming bitter or are you becoming better? Which is it? And then, are you becoming a victim or are you becoming a victor? Are you allowing disappointments and offenses to create a bitter root that is eating away at your faith, your hope, and especially your love? Are you willing to cut out that bitter root and be at peace with yourself and your enemies? and your God because that's the reward. You ask yourself, what's the reward for all this pain that you're talking about, reconciliation and forgiveness? That hurts. What's the reward? And I tell you, the reward is peace. That's the reward. Peace of mind, peace in your heart, peace with others. I think that's a much more valuable entity, a much more valuable commodity than bitterness. And so if you are, then I invite you to give up that bitter heart to Jesus Christ this morning. You can do it. Come, be baptized, remove it, and all other sins forever. Talk about peace. Come and lay your heart before God for healing and let the elders pray over you that God may forgive you and that you might know true peace of mind and heart. Come and receive the prayers of the church for strength to continue in the struggle to forgive and to love again and to not be subject to the bitterness which is so easily 
uh, it so easily finds its way into all of our hearts. And I include myself in that. If, if there are those in the congregation this morning who have been touched by the message, by the need to give up this bitterness for whatever reason in your heart, for however long you've carried it, if you wish for the end of bitterness and the beginning of peace to begin this morning and you need the ministry of the church, then we do encourage you to come forward now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.